percent belong to diabetics. Diabetics have three times as many deaths from heart disease as non-diabetics. They have about three quarters of all the strokes. They have their number one in blindness. So it's really a tragedy to be a long-term diabetic. And yet, when we look over the history of diabetes, we found that as long as 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians knew exactly what to do with diabetes. They knew exactly what diet to put you on. They didn't understand why it worked, but it certainly did. And everything was going well until a couple hundred years ago when the Surgeon General of England decided that since the diabetics spilled so much sugar out of the urine, the body couldn't handle carbohydrates, and so he took all the carbohydrates out of the diet. And that was probably the first high-fat, high-protein diet, and that's the way it's been ever since. And that really increased our incidence of diabetes because that's the kind of diet that causes diabetes. And although people thought that when insulin was first developed, that, that was the end of diabetes because that's going to cure it all, we discover now that over 90% of all diabetics have more insulin than they need in the body. They have much more than normal people have, two and three times as much. So we find that diabetes is not a problem of insufficient insulin. But then we had to find out if you've got so much insulin, why are you diabetic? Why doesn't your insulin digest your sugar? Why does the sugar rise so high in the blood unhampered by anything? It isn't digested. It rises so high it spills out through the kidneys. Why does that happen? Because the insulin is insensitized. The insulin we find is protecting the sugar with a fat layer. When your fat rises high in your blood, it's like a barrier between the glucose, your sugar in your blood, and the insulin. And the insulin simply cannot burn up the glucose when there's too much fat in the blood. And many people have thought that diabetes is hereditary. But this whole idea has just been dispelled when we go into the studies because Dr. Pike of England probably has the largest group of identical twin diabetics in the world in his registry. And he has followed probably 300 sets of identical twins. And he finds, after tracing many of these twins, that some twins, after they get their diabetes, the other twin is not diabetic for as much as 30 years that he's followed them. He said if there can be such a great difference in time between the time one gets diabetes and one doesn't, it cannot be a disease by heredity, or else they both get it within a reasonable time. And so he has been the first man to offer evidence that diabetes is not a hereditary disease. There may be some reasons to try and believe it, but if you can't have both identical twins have the diabetes, it cannot be hereditary. And we find out what is the principal reason for diabetes because in experiments that we've done, done in the early 1920s, done with Dr. Rabinowitz of Canada, we know that as you lower the fat, most diabetics then have their insulin become sensitive enough so they're no longer diabetic. And three or four years ago when we started to try our diet on various patients who had diabetes, our record was that 50% of all diabetics and insulin would get off insulin within four weeks. We introduced our diet to Dr. James Anderson of the University of Kentucky Medical Center three years ago, and he gets the same results as we do. He now has had 50 diabetics through his program, and his diabetics are getting off insulin at the same rate. So that we realize that diabetes is not the problem people have thought. And when Dr. Kelly M. West, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Oklahoma Medical School, said last year before the Senate hearings that if this high carbohydrate diet we used, two thirds of all diabetics would be off all the drugs, insulin, and so on in a short time. That diabetes as a disease would disappear from our country. Dr. West is a man that's been a specialist in diabetes for many, many years, and he's a conservative physician. Well, we've had many tests for trying to help diabetics. The big university group diabetic program where they tested the oral drugs and discovered that the oral drugs for diabetes increase the death rate from heart disease by 250% than those who did not take any drugs. And yet, when the New Jersey State of Board of Health questioned the cardiologists in New Jersey, they found that 85% of them were still using these drugs for even their heart patients who had diabetes. So you wonder what these double-blind studies teach physicians when they still continue using the drugs that are apparently creating a greater incidence of heart disease. The best and the only solution for diabetes is that you must get to the diet that creates it and control it by a proper diet.
High blood pressure is one of the most widely spread diseases in our country. It's hard to believe that about 60 million people have high blood pressure. That's considering that there's only about 120 million adults in our country. One out of every two adults has high blood pressure. You have 100 people in the room, you have 50 people then who have high blood pressure. It hardly seems possible it's such a national, national epidemic. Physicians used to think that high blood pressure was primarily a problem with too much salt in the diet. But when Dr. James I. Connor of the U.S. Department of Agriculture did his study, he selected men and women who were on a normal American diet, 43% total calories and fat, normal amount of cholesterol, and the normal amount of salt, which was 10 grams of salt a day, about a third of an ounce of salt a day. And he decided not to change their salt, give them exactly the amount of salt they'd been eating, only to change their fat. He brought their fat from 43% down to 25%. And he was very careful not to change your calories. He didn't want anyone to lose weight because the first thing a physician says is lose weight, cut down salt, your high blood pressure will go away. Ten days after they're on the diet and all they did was reduce the fat from 43% to 25%, everyone's blood pressure dropped 10%. That means if your top number was 160, you'd go down to 144, practically in a normal range, from an abnormal range. And if your top number was 100, that's certainly not acceptable it would go down to 90 in your bottom number, which could be acceptable. So the difference between normal and abnormal in just 10 days, Dr. Icon was able to do by not touching salt at all. No one lost weight. They all had the normal amount of salt. He kept them on that for 40 days, and the blood pressure stayed down. And one of the interesting things about the study is that he noticed that the platelets, the little cells that create clotting in the body, the sticking together, the platelets, reduced 50% when he cut the fat down just from 43% to 25%. And that made him very happy because the new evidence had just come out that diabetic retinopathy, that's the problem that diabetics have where they go blind, where the retina bleeds and so on. Diabetic retinopathy, the severity, is correlated to the amount of platelets sticking together, platelet aggregation. So if he could reduce platelet aggregation by 50%, he could probably reduce the damage to diabetics' eyes he considered that more important than the lowering of the blood pressure. Now, of course, he only went down to 25%. You can imagine how low you can reduce the platelets sticking together down at an 8% fat diet. Well, the diabetic specialists didn't recommend, of course, reducing fat. They just gave people aspirin and other drugs to try and reduce platelet stickiness. Diet, I guess, is not an acceptable program among physicians yet. When Dr. Iacono increased the fats in the diet, all their blood pressures went back to where they were. It was one of the best studies showing that salt is a much lesser factor than fat in high blood pressure. There has been a consensus in treating high blood pressure. The National Institute of Health, the American Heart Association, the American Public Health Institute, everybody has agreed that there's one way to treat high blood pressure, and that is drug therapy for the rest of your life. Stepped up drug therapy, you start with a single drug. If that doesn't work, there are two drugs. Then you go to three drugs, then you go to four drugs. Then you go to potassium supplements. It's all worked out. Every physician now gets a copy on how to treat high blood pressure according to the consensus. Yet, how much is talked about in the consensus booklet about diet and so on? They do say that you could ask your patient to cut down his salt intake and he could lose weight. Otherwise, nothing is told about diet. The idea is drug therapy. Now, how effective is drug therapy? First of all, drug therapy for hypertension does not cure hypertension. It doesn't affect the disease in any way. It just paralyzes the body's ability to raise pressure. So one thing that happens is that as you paralyze the body's ability to raise pressure, your blood flow drops. And people have to have a certain minimum amount of blood flow to have normal function. So one of the side effects of hypertension drugs, as they lower blood pressure and lower blood flow, is sexual impotency. And a study done on men taking the drugs for two years 50% lost their sexual potency because without blood flow, you don't have erections. How about uric acid level? The hypertensive drugs artificially force uric acid levels up. Another study, 50% of the men had uric acid levels raised into the gout range, and so they had to then take drugs to lower uric acid level. Well, they took drugs to lower uric acid level, and the principal drugs are xyloprim, benamid, 